Good morning. Good morning, as I would say to my daughters, who are uh, every bit as loud as your entire collective audience, uh, it's time to giddy up. Yeehaw! That's right. So I'd like to introduce uh, Don Keller, one of our two inpatient chief medical residents. He's going to be giving a splendid talk, I can tell you that, because I've seen some of it firsthand. Um, and it's a lot of fun to, uh, to talk about John. I've had a great time getting to know him this year. He's a very quiet, kind, compassionate man with uh, a bit of a sense of, sense of humor to him. And uh, he's a bit of a daredevil, which uh, is not immediately obvious. So I'm just going to walk you through some of his background here. He was born in Indiana. And uh, isn't that cute? I mean, for Pete's sakes. And even then, he was bold enough to wear pink. Now, one of the things about John that you should know, though, you can see his arms up like this. He's kind of moving. And, and this is the way he learned the multiplication uh, table. Uh, the only way that he could learn how to multiply was by jogging as he looked at the cards. And fortunately, he had a teacher who was uh, willing to do that and allow him to jog around the class and then look at his seven times seven. John, what's seven times seven? <laughs> Sorry. I won't ask you right now. <laughs> uh, but I'll, Already, already, he recognized that the best kind of learning is active learning and not passive learning. Uh, here he is. Uh, uh, he is an admirer of Jan Hirschman, and early on, he was wearing a bow tie. Uh, here he is getting a little more stylish. Look at that. Look at that. Sorry, ladies, he's taken. So here he is, he was a catcher uh, in high school. Uh, he grew up in Indiana, and you'll see he's wearing purple because from here on out, he is a UW man. Uh, he moved to the University of Washington for undergraduate, where he uh, graduated with a degree in biochemistry, Phi Beta Kappa. Then we had the pleasure of having him come to our medical school, where he graduated Alpha Omega Alpha. And then he came to our residency and our chief residency. Uh, each year, uh, <laughs> Yes, this is uh, yet another picture of uh, the two chief residents. And I'm often asked, do I try to select the chief residents based on compatibility? And the answer is no, because I have no idea how to determine that. Uh, in some years, the chief residents are friendly, but not really close. In other years, they're quite close. And in this case, they're close and equally friendly. So John and Lindsay have gone along really, really uh, well this year. They've had a terrific time together. Uh, John is probably the second biggest fan of Lindsay. Uh, it's, a, it's a tie for first between Lindsay's mom and her boyfriend. Uh, but Lindsay, Lindsay and John have been a, a wonderful duo. Now, uh, before I move on to the, the next slide, um, this is the side of John that you just don't guess. He's got this kind of quiet demeanor, uh, but he's a bit of a, a hell-bent man. Here he is uh, in an exotic location uh, doing some exotic things. Now, in 2009, uh, he was selected Van Driver of the Year, and he has this on his CV. Uh, he got an upgrade last year in 2015, and here he is on his brand new team. Yeah, he is gone. Um, and uh, I couldn't get a picture of him in all leather, but uh, this is as close as I could get. So, before I move on to the last couple of slides, there's just one other little story I want to tell about John. Uh, I mentioned last week that I have a tradition of going to Ray's Boathouse a couple, three times a year to see presidents or bike out there or the two kind of And John and I were trailing up and we were just kind of off on the horizon. And Yuhan was driving there because she had ruined her knee. But it's better, there's Yuhan. Uh, and uh, we arrived at the restaurant and we had a cat over a couple of clams. And we got on to, uh, it wasn't Matchmaker, but there's, uh, there's a variety of websites where you can meet somebody. And we were talking about the components of it. I really didn't know anything about it, so I didn't know anything about it. It turns out that he's in great rich. And it's fact like he's in high school, and he said, oh, I want to meet him or whatever. And if you can put dislikes, the things are absolutely incompatible. And so, Steve uh, Hahn and Lindsay were talking about things, and there's just no way they want to cross the page. Uh, well, John, but all she wants to do is watch you and the family too. I don't know, I, I just 
I bought one day with it, but I might really like it. <laughs> John, all she likes listening to is Mandy Dark Town. Oh, but she likes me. <laughs> John, her idea of a great time is the fact that they're in the same room. But if I like her. <laughs> so, uh, this is. <laughs> so, this is John. <laughs> Um, fortunately, he discovered a real gem. So this is Carolyn. Um, they're both baseball nuts, like going to the Mayfair game. And as far as I can tell, she's practically perfect. So uh, uh, there, there was nothing there to X off. And this is my last picture of the two of them together, uh, showing that John can still be very stylish, although he's outclassed completely by Carolyn. Uh, at least not see there. Uh, so I'd like to give a really nice, big, warm round of applause to John. Apparently what happens at Rays doesn't stay at Rays. <laughs> so I have no, no disclosures. So you may be more familiar with the phrase of see one, do one, teach one. But today we're going to talk about something different. We're going to talk about, talk about simulate one, do one, teach one. Now simulation could be any artificial representation <laughs> of a real world experience to achieve an educational goal. Now Going back to see one, do one, teach one, this really came from Dr. William Halstead, who was the first chair of surgery at Johns Hopkins University. He was really known for transforming the medical environment into the apprenticeship model. So you learned on the job. As you were working, you saw one, then you had to jump in and do one. Now, it turns out he worked like a maniac, and he required his residents to be on call 362 days a year and was fueled by cocaine and not all of us have that option. <laughs> but this is what it could look like. This is what see one, do one, teach one could look like. It's a giant auditorium. There's an attending physician who's down in front. He's got a scalpel in his hand. He's trying to tell you what he's about ready to go do. Maybe you're this guy who's up there. You can't really see very well, but you're nervous because next time you have to go down there and you have to do the surgery. And today it hasn't changed all that much. We're still in big auditoriums, not unlike this environment here today. It's still kind of hard to see down front. You still have someone who's telling you something you should know. So you're kind of bored. Maybe you're on your phone like this person here. You're texting your friend over here. You're like, well, why isn't this Grand Rounds talk as good as Dr. Lux? I don't know. But this can be a very frustrating experience. So Johnny Depp here, he asks our young pupil, he asks him, what, what are you studying, son? And he looks up with great sadness and he says, medicine. <laughs> and he's consoled. Why is this so sad? Why is this so frustrating? <laughs> Part of the problem is the amount of medical knowledge that you have to absorb to be a good practitioner is exponentially increasing over time. And yet the, the tools that we use for education are roughly the same as they were when the Wright brothers were tinkering at Kitty Hawk. So how do we overcome this challenge, this increasing amount of medical knowledge without adding on seven years to medical school training or residency. Well, one option is to make the lessons stickier. Now let's go through an example. I'm sure many of you can remember back to medical school and the first time you had to deliver a baby. <laughs> Maybe your attending physician uh, delivered a baby did it really well, and then he looks at you, pats you on the back, and sits you down in the chair and be like, next one is yours. And that's one way to do it. That's the apprenticeship model. You see one, then you jump in there. You have to do one. You're kind of nervous. You don't want to drop the nut. <laughs> so this is one way to do it. But 
I'm going to show you an example of what a simulation might look like. Now, if you didn't hear it at the end, he said that babies are slippery. He said, nice touch. And I, what I'd like to do over the course of this talk is tell you how simulations can make lessons stickier. Now, uh, we'll briefly go through a little bit of uh, history and healthcare simulation, how simulation actually operates well within adult learner-centered principles. It can improve clinical training and even some patient outcomes like patient safety, and then end with some keys to effective simulation. So going back in time, the ancient Egyptians actually were quite good at developing anatomic models based off the mummification process, very intricate, very detailed, but they're really just used for private use. It wasn't used for education. It wasn't on public display. In the third century, this is one of the uh, earliest known surviving clay models from the Mayan culture where they had essentially half a head that was normal and the other half was a skeleton. Again, very intricate models. And these were actually used for public display and actually mementos that life could be short and a reminder of that. We then get into the 10th century during the time of the Song Dynasty in China. And the imperial physician at that time was tasked with the responsibility of standardizing acupuncture across all practitioners. So he developed these two <laughs> simulators. They're two bronze life-size statues that had over 350 holes. You could fill them with fake organs and you could practice the acupuncture technique on these before moving on to a real person. Now we fast forward a little bit more into 16th and 17th century Europe. This is actually a wax sculpture Again, very intricate. There are often multiple layers of tissue that could be peeled back and reveal the underlying layer, sometimes a skeleton underneath. These are actually used to teach medical students anatomy. Again, almost always in these very artistic poses. Uh, now we get a little bit higher fidelity, a little closer to real life in our simulators. This is an obstetrical simulator a little different from the watermelon model that we saw earlier. But this was developed by the king's midwife in France in the 1700s. And she used it to teach surgeons and midwives students how to do deliveries. And she even remarked at the time that they could practice any delivery imaginable now. We now get to the 1960s where there's the first full man simulator this is not a real patient that's on the bed. This is a simulator. He was known as Sim 1. And he could do all sorts of things. He could breathe, he had a heartbeat, he could cough, he could vomit up the endotracheal tube you were just trying to put in. It was mainly used for teaching anesthesiologists how to uh, care for patients in the operating room. Now I'd say despite all of these advances in technology and simulators, <laughs> Medicine in general as a field was slower to adopt simulation as an educational technique compared to other industries like astronauts practicing in zero gravity environments. And I'd even uh, give the example in medicine of this is Dr. Killian, who was a German physician who performed the first bronchoscopy in 1897. And he even remarked at the time that this is a very difficult procedure. You have to, with a quiet hand, manipulate the forceps and the hooklets deep down in the bronchus. And he said then their manipulation at so great a depth was not an easy manner, but may be learned and practiced on a phantom. And I have constructed one for this purpose. And this was published in 1902. It wasn't until 100 years later, in 2001, that the first study came out that published the use of simulation as an educational tool for improving bronchoscopy skills in novice practitioners. And yet they called it a revolution at the time, but it was a hundred years ago when the first phantom was developed. Now, why does simulation work so well? Now, I'll take you back to think about how people learn. And think about a young child who's riding in a car is looking outside, almost everything is new. He's just learning by absorbing all of this information like a sponge. Compare that to adults. I would wager that 
many of you coming to Grand Rounds today probably don't even remember the route that you took here. I mean, what was the Grand Rounds talk again today? Something about a sim, I don't know. Or you're listening to music or you're just bored like this gentleman. There's a different level of engagement that's required when you're gonna teach adults. And what I'd like to share with you is how simulation actually fits very well with adult learner-centered educational principles. So this is Malcolm Knowles, who is really the, the father of adult education theory. And he had six assumptions about how adults learn differently from children. Firstly, that it's really self-directed learning for adults. They also bring life experiences to the education environment and can build off of those. They prefer and do best when learning things that are directly applicable and relate to real life experiences. They're also motivated to learn internally, right? Compare that to children where it's really just external forces. And they need to know why they're gonna learn something before they invest the time and effort into it. And I would argue that these principles actually fit very well with simulation. There's a lot of overlap that's there. And I want to focus on one of these aspects that I think is very powerful, that the locus of control for learning and simulation is internal rather than external. And I, I want to explain this with a very simple experiment. So this is known as the tapper and listener experiment. The tapper is given the task of tapping out a very well-known song the listeners have to guess what that song is. Now it's an easy, well-known song. So the tapper thinks, oh, this should be easy. I can get people to guess this song. So we're gonna try this. I'm gonna play a tapping of a song. And see if you can figure out what this is. I see some smiles. I'm sure some people got it. About 50% of people can guess what this is usually when this experiment is done. But if you don't get it, it can be extremely frustrating on both sides. I, as the tapper, I have the curse of knowledge. I know the title of the song. I know how the song goes. I think this is very easy. They should be able to get it. And as the listener, you're like, this you said it was easy. I should be able to guess what this song is, but I can't quite figure out what it is. Anyone get it? Happy birthday song. But it's an example of the, the power of doing something yourself rather than having someone else do it for you and trying to learn based off of that. Now, building off of this tapping example, we actually do some tapping in medicine. So often use percussion as a physical exam technique, tapping on patients, see if there's an air filled space underneath or some fluid filled space or something solid. And often can be difficult for students to learn. You're up next to a patient, you're tapping on their chest. So you see, this is over the lung and see, this is over a rib. Can you hear the difference there? You can hear that, right? And like, yeah, sure, I can hear the difference. <laughs> but I wanna try an example of a very simple simulator that we can all do in our chairs here at Grand Rounds. So to simulate an air-filled space as you're tapping, everyone puff out your cheeks kind of chickmunk style, and then tap on your cheek a few times. Now deflate your cheeks and tap again. You can feel the difference between the two. So air filled, solid. Right, it's a very simple maneuver, but can often be very instructive when you're teaching students. You can even give some feedback or like, well, maybe you should tap a little harder. You're not quite in the right space. And many forms of simulation fit within the same framework. You explain what you're gonna do. There's some sort of framework beforehand. Let's practice this tapping so you're better at doing it with students. You do the simulation, you give, you give some directed real-time feedback, and then the transference of knowledge occurs. Now there's many different scenarios where simulation can be used in healthcare. The tapping example we just went through is an example of a low risk normal finding 
we could go on the wards and tap on as many patients as we wanted to. We're not going to hurt them. But being able to repeat it and get some feedback on it, may be able to uh, help improve your skills for when you go see a real patient. There's also this notion of something that's difficult to learn. So take, for example, a difficult to interpret heart murmur. So maybe a patient has that. You can go listen to him as many times as you want. Again, it's not unsafe for the patient. But in a simulator, maybe you could amplify the volume of that. You could have a tracing of the heartbeat behind it as you're listening. So you can just facilitate some better learning. And then, of course, there's the scenarios of rare events or high-risk events where you don't want to do something that would be unsafe for a patient, like practicing an invasive procedure or running a code, for an example. But let's go through a few scenarios where simulation has been shown to improve clinical training. So we'll take a central line, for example. You're going to put in a big IV into the neck vein. And if I were to write out how you do a central line, this is what it would look like. It's actually completely running off the page. Even if we focus on one aspect, let's say we're going to use ultrasound guidance and we're going to take our needle and just the skills to take the needle from the skin and go down into the vein so you can insert your catheter. It still runs off the screen. And I'll even give you some visual examples. We'll walk through that, but it's still not the same as doing it yourself. So I could tell you, well, this is what it would look like. We have our ultrasound probe there. You got your needle there ready to go. Say, well, there's an indicator mark on the side of the probe here. I can zoom in on it so you can see it a little bit better. I'll tell you, well, this indicator mark corresponds to this blue dot that's on the side of the ultrasound screen. So when you're introducing the needle and thinking about your three-dimensional space, if your indicator mark on the probe is on the same side as the blue dot on the screen, then you're oriented in the correct direction. So what's left is on the screen is going to be left when you're operating in the field. And let's even simplify it even further. Not even talking about neck vein, just getting vascular access, putting in an IV. I'd say in the previous slide, I told you all the information you need to know to answer this question. I'll even highlight, so here's the needle that's being introduced into the skin. I'll tell you this little, this little dot here is the needle that's on the ultrasound screen. Big hole, black hole in the middle is the vein. So where is this needle tip in relation to that blood vessel? And it's very difficult, even after going through all those examples and even giving some visualizations, if you're trying to teach someone how to put in a central line, there's no replacement for doing it yourself and being able to see it in three-dimensional space. And I'll tell you that this needle is medial to the vessel. You can't see the indicator mark on the probe, so it's on the opposite side. The needle mark on the ultrasound screen is on the opposite side of the vessel compared to that blue dot, so it's medial. Still confusing, right? Let's take a look at what an example would look like with this gentleman using a simulator. In real time, three-dimensional space is able to navigate that needle from the skin all the way down into the vessel. Before going out and doing this on a real patient where there's risk for puncturing things you don't want to. And it turns out that this has been studied uh, in, a, in a robust fashion. This was a study looking at 103 uh, residents, both internal medicine and emergency <laughs> medicine, and they split them into two groups while they were on their medical ICU rotation. There was a traditional group and a simulator group. The traditional group just got the apprenticeship model. They were learning on the job. They saw their senior do a, a, a central line, then they had to jump in and do one. The simulator group got actual dedicated training on a central line simulator to practice these skills. They looked at several different outcomes. How many needle passes did they need to make in order to be successful? How many arteries did they accidentally puncture? How many times did the central venous catheter need to be adjusted after that x-ray was taken? Their overall success rate and things you don't want to happen, complications like a pneumothorax. They looked at two different kinds of central lines, putting in a subclavian and an internal jugular. With the subclavian, there weren't enough numbers to be uh, powered to see a difference between the two groups. 
but with the internal jugular line placement, there was significant improvement in the simulator trained group compared to the traditionally trained group. In every category except pneumothorax, where the event rate was very low, too low to see a difference. And when you combine all of those central lines together, the same thing bore out in the end. So really to summarize this, the simulator trained residents were more successful and had less complications than the traditionally trained residents. Turns out there's been uh, several scenarios, not just central line placement, where simulation has been compared to traditional education. This is a meta-analysis that looked at studies from 1990 until 2010. They had three very simple inclusion criteria. Simulation had to be used as an educational intervention. There had to be some sort of comparison group, either a randomized uh, control trial or a pre and post testing. And then they had to assess some sort of skill, not just knowledge and not just comfort level with doing something after you had a simulator training. And there were 633 total learners across 14 studies that met this inclusion criteria. And the way that this correlation plot works is if the number is less than zero, it favors traditional education. And if it's greater than zero, it favors simulation training. And every single one of these studies with high confidence levels favored simulation training over traditional education, over sort of apprenticeship model. The overall effect size after you add all these together was 0.71, which as a statistical number, that's a large effect. And I wanted to go through a couple of these studies, starting with this one in 2010, I'll give you a few more examples. This was a study that looked at auscultation, cardiac auscultation skills in medical students. They had two groups. One was third year medical students. The other was fourth year medical students, both on required medicine clerkship rotation. They did baseline testing on a simulator. For those that haven't seen this before, this is Harvey. He's a cardiac simulator. He can make several common cardiac findings, uh, make cardiac sounds, uh, common murmurs. And they did some baseline testing on this. Could they detect 12 commonly encountered cardiac findings? S3, S4, murmurs, pericardial rub, things like that that we hope medical students would be able to learn. The third year students then got simulation education. Again, with the same simulator, but now with an expert clinician teaching them alongside the simulator. The fourth year students didn't get any intervention other than they were on their regular rotation. Then they did something else very interesting. <laughs> the crew here. They went out and did post-testing, not only on the simulator, but also on real patients. Dr. Krug's very excited to be examined by these medical students. So what did they find? At baseline, as you might expect, the fourth-year students trended toward doing better than the third-year students, but didn't quite meet statistical significance. After the simulation training, the third-year students far outperformed the fourth-year students on the simulator. And then when they went out to examine real patients with expert cardiologists, both with more than 15 years experience adjudicating this, blinded as to the educational status of the residents, the third year students still statistically significantly outperformed the traditionally trained residents. Now, we've been talking about some auscultation skills and line skills, but there's also some cognitive skills that simulation can improve. One of them is delivering difficult news, which is something we encounter frequently, right? We've all been in this scenario. You're kind of nervously smiling. The patient is nervously smiling. They know something's up though, right? They're like, what's the diagnosis, doctor? You're kind of nervous. You're not quite sure what to say. You're kind of sweating a little bit. So you could have just blurted out, well, what's your zodiac sign? And he says, cancer. <laughs> it doesn't always work out like this, right? But simulation can actually improve your skills in delivering difficult news. So this study from 2010, they looked at second year medicine residents. 
they did some pre-testing in the fall with some palliative care experts who were evaluating them. This wasn't just their own personal comfort level with delivering difficult news. And split them into two groups, like in a control group that really didn't get any additional training other than being on their regular rotations and a simulation group that went through some scenarios with standardized patients, again with palliative care experts evaluating them and coaching them. And then they tested everyone again in the spring. And what they found was in uh, breaking bad news, there was a trend toward improvement in the simulator group, but didn't quite meet, meet statistical significance. Though in being able to respond to emotion, statistically significantly better response in the simulation group compared to the control group. It's also very interesting in this study that they didn't evaluate, I'm sorry, they didn't have direction of care as a goal of the simulation experience. In other words, guiding the discussion after you've delivered the difficult news. So there wasn't a difference between the two groups as you might expect without that being a goal of the simulation. Another example is improving advanced cardiac life support skills or running codes. And this was mostly focused again on the cognitive levels. Can you, uh, do you know the ACLS algorithms? Can you lead a team appropriately? This was a randomized trial with medicine residents split into two different groups, A and B. Both had baseline testing, common ACLS scenarios, unstable tachycardia, bradycardia, ventricular fibrillation arrest. How well could you perform in these scenarios? Group A then got simulator training and they tested everyone again. Then they did something very interesting. They did a, a crossover and group B also got simulation and they tested everyone a third time. What they found was that baseline, there was no difference in performance in these ACLS scenarios between the two groups. After group A got simulator training, they far outperformed group B. And then when they cross over and did simulation with group B, they came up to the level of group A. And the other thing I would point out is that group A didn't lose their skills over that additional time period. Now, we've been talking about improving your own skills, but I'd say we'll take it one step further, that simulation can actually improve some patient outcomes, like patient safety. And this is an important issue. This report was uh, published in 1999 that really brought to the forefront the issues of patient safety and medical errors. And they encouraged in really every arena of healthcare to improve our patient safety. And this includes education, and they recommended using simulations whenever possible, especially when training novice practitioners, when doing problem solving, and when doing crisis management. And we'll, we're going to go back to our central line example and see if we can improve residents in their sterile technique. If they're doing procedures more sterilely, theoretically, you have less infections in your patients. So another randomized trial, they took residents, baseline testing, how well did you do in maintaining sterile technique in your procedures? They split them into two groups. One just watched a video walking through what sterile technique should look like. The other actually did simulation, practicing doing sterile technique. And they looked at several different outcomes. Did you prepare your materials sterilely? Did you hand wash appropriately? Did you maintain a sterile field? Did you gown, glove, did and drape appropriately. And I'll point out that all of these medicine residents, they're signed off on center lines. They should be able to perform these and have full sterile technique. And what they found was at baseline, neither group did very well at all. The total score for each individual box is out of 20. There was no difference between the, the groups, but both did very poorly. Again, these are all signed off residents. And then after the simulation, the simulator group did significantly better than the traditionally trained, than the video group in nearly every category. And even in sterile field and gloving, it was almost statistically significant. There's a trend in that direction. So they did something else that was very interesting. They then went back and did simulation with that group that had just gotten the video. So now every medicine resident has gotten simulator training and they followed up to see if some patient outcomes changed. And now their control group, 
was the surgical ICU, where there were no interventions at all compared to the medicine ICU, where now everyone has gotten simulator training. And they looked at catheter infection rate. So this is what the medical ICU looked like over a period of three years in terms of the number of catheter central line associated infections. Their simulation intervention was right in the middle. And if I add in a trend line here, you can see that there was improvement in infection rates over this three year period. Now let's compare this to the surgical ICU where there was really no difference at all pre and post the simulation intervention. If you put the two together, there was a statistically significant decrease in central line associated infections in the medical ICU group, as you might expect. And this is without, again, any other intervention in the ICUs uh, that were uh, talking about patient safety or sterile technique. There was no difference in the sickness acuity of these patients in either ICU pre or post. They took it one step further. They looked at, well, how much money does this save by preventing these infections? So for every infection that was prevented, they saved about $82,000 per patient. The total cost of their simulation intervention was $112,000. So over the course of a year, for the infections that they prevented, they saved almost $700,000 again annually. It's very powerful. The last example I want to uh, provide is in the primary care environment. It actually looked at decreasing risky pr prescribing behavior. This was a randomized controlled trial of 57 <laughs> attending primary care physicians who were split into two groups. Again, a control, they just did their normal thing. The simulator group had several virtual patient scenarios that they went through online that focused on a couple of different diseases uh, diabetes and then lipid control. The virtual patient scenarios were quite realistic. The, they had an electronic medical record. They interacted with patients over this. They changed doses of medications. They scheduled follow-up. And what they found between the two groups, one of their goals was to look at risky prescribing. And they looked at how many times metformin was prescribed in, uh, in severe kidney disease. And they saw that in the simulation group and the control group, there was a decrease, though it was significantly more in the simulation group. They also showed, interestingly, uh, and I'll point out, this is now going back to their real patient panels and following up their real patient panels after doing the simulation. They also showed that their diabetics were better controlled. They had lower A1C levels in the simulation group compared to control. The amount of A1C testing and LDL testing and LDL levels were not statistically different between the two groups. Now, in the last part of the talk here, I want to talk about some keys to effective simulation. Right after uh, my talk, there's going to be uh, some awards presented to residents who are excellent teachers. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, I want to win myself one of these teaching awards. And as you're thinking about your teaching, you think, well, maybe I could just use some PowerPoint, I'd say, let's see if we can get you to use the simulator <laughs> in this certain sense. Now, some keys to effective simulation. I'd like to point out that the technique is not the same as the technology, and the technology is not the same as the technique. So that means you could have a very expensive, fancy simulator machine, and without the right learning environment, without the right framework, without the right objectives, the debriefing, the feedback that goes into it, it's just an expensive piece of, piece of metal. You also don't need fancy technology to do simulation. The example we use with the, the tapping, it's very simple, yet can be quite instructive for medical students who are trying to learn that technique. It's important to make sure that what you're teaching, really in any uh, learning environment, is applicable. It applies to real life situations. I also want to try not to cover too much. It's easy to do that, especially in a simulation scenario, but to have some key points that you focus on to get your teaching points across. And then what may be a little bit unique in group teaching sessions, which simulation is often in that, in that setting, is sensitivity to the individual learner. 
not every uh, individual learner may learn best in a simu simulation uh, or a group learning environment. And the confidentiality of their learning may be compromised, which is not really a factor you have to consider in a lecture hall uh, as an example. So I hope I've shown over the course of this talk that simulation fits very well with adult learning principles can also make lessons stickier. Showing you some examples of improving both procedural as well as cognitive learning. It can enhance, but not replace, real world, real life patient experiences. And it improves patient outcomes like patient safety. And in conclusion, I would say, just send it. <laughs> Before we get to the question, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Brad and Bill and Ken for all their mentorship this year, uh, to John and to Doug Powell and the medicine student programs, all of my co-chiefs that are here, especially Lindsay and Gianna were my co-chiefs here at UW, Ursula and Kelly for keeping my head on straight, my friends and family, but especially to the greatest house staff in the known universe, supporting you guys this year has been the best part of this job, so thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions before we get to the awards.